Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and boy, do we have a treat for you tonight. We're going to dive into some exponential functions. We're going to talk about how to drive them, and we're going to look at some applications. And I can't help but get excited whenever we tackle exponential functions. And uh, first and foremost here is as you analyze this graph, I tell you what, if the stock market treated us very well, we'd see our money grow at the similar rate as these functions increase at an increasing rate. But nonetheless, what do you know about E? Um... Let's say we know that E is approximately 2.718281, yada, yada, yada. What do you need to know about E? Well, he is a constant, just like pi. And uh, let's see, he's very irrational. The decimal is never ending, and it's non-repeatable. Let's see here. And... Last but not least, I want you to know that it's a very special number, and hopefully by the, t the end of tonight's video we'll have convinced you why he is so special. But if we want to graph the function y equals e to the x, we've got a really nice picture here in front of us. We do know that the graph possesses some asymptotic behavior there right along the x-axis. When we do sketch this on our quizzes, we make sure that we label the asymptote as y equals zero. We make sure that we label the y-intercept. Those are some defining characteristics. And... Uh, and it certainly is a fun graph. All right, some real basic properties that I want us to have down pat. And as you got that picture fresh in your mind, the domain, uh, the graph extends infinitely to the left and infinitely to the right, so our domain is all real numbers. The range, however, does not include the zero, so I'm going to use a parenthesis, and then it does extend infinitely high. Okay, we're going to say that the function is continuous and increasing on its entire domain. We're also going to say that the curve is concave up on its entire domain. In other words, this function is increasing at an increasing rate, which is kind of exciting. And um, a couple of fun limits here. If we want to know what's the limit as x approaches negative infinity for e to the x, really can't do a power fight there. We just need to visualize the graph and know that the curve is approaching a height of zero. Or we could ask ourselves, what's the limit as x approaches positive infinity for e to the x? And you'll notice that it shoots sky high. Well, let's cut right to the chase and see why mathematicians get so fired up about this function. And we ask ourselves, what kind of magical powers does this function have? f of x equals e to the x. What kind of magical powers does he have? Well, he's the only function in all of math that is its own what? derivative. In other words, what you'll notice here as you look at that curve, and we'll pick this point right here, the y-coordinate is positive yet very small, and the slope at that same moment is very, very, again, positive yet very, very small. And as you move along the curve, the y-values are increasing and the slopes are increasing and increasing and incre increasing. In fact, what we're going to discover here is that the slope at any instantaneous moment is exactly the same as the y-coordinate. All right, so here are our rules. If we want to derive just good old-fashioned e to the x, as we mentioned on the last slide, he is his own derivative. And then if we want to get a little fancier here and derive e to a more obnoxious power, a more intense power, what we're going to do is, is the original function multiplied by the derivative of the exponent. And we'll put a little asterisk there. u is a function of x. In other words, u could be, you know, tangent squared of x, or u could be, you know, um, basically anything that you could imagine in your mind, you know, x, uh, trinomial like x squared minus 2x plus 3 and so forth and so forth. So those are the basic rules we've got to memorize. And, uh, you know, at this point here, there's no, you know, there's no shortcuts. We just got to roll up our sleeves and we got to practice a lot of examples and the first one I want to throw at you, I want you to consider the function e raised to the 2x minus 1 power. And if we wanted to derive that function, we would say it is the original function times the derivative of the exponent. And the exponent is just a very simple binomial whose derivative is 2. And, of course, we could probably spice it up a little bit and just say 2e to the 2x minus 1. And then, of course, that function could be used for finding all sorts of instantaneous slopes. All right, another exciting function might be e raised to the negative 3 divided by x. 
And um, I think a, a particular trait that a lot of good calculus students have is the ability to rewrite the original function in an effort to set themselves up for the easiest possible derivative. And so what I'm doing is I'm rewriting that exponent so that it has a negative power. And the derivative is going to be e to the u, in other words, the original function, multiplied by the derivative of the exponent. And in this case, again, it's a very simple monomial, so I'm going to use my power rule. And I've got positive 3x to the negative 2. And so if we just spice that up just a hair, we could say that the derivative is really... Hmm, let's see here. I could say 3e to the negative 3 over x, all divided by x squared. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our first derivative. If we wanted to go get a second derivative, we would have to use what rule? Hopefully you were yelling quotient rule. Or, in fact, it would be quotient to this guy. Or, you could go product rule and apply it to this step right here. Go product right there. All right, our next, our third example is an applied problem, and they want us to find all relative extrema. Now, relative extrema is kind of on an umbrella that includes both relative maxes and relative mins. So we want to find both. And what we're going to do, and, I, and sometimes I like to kind of visualize where I'm going with the problem before I dive in, what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the first derivative, I'm going, to then find, I'm going to set that first derivative equal to zero so that I can find all of its critical points. I'm then going to construct a sign chart. And whenever the first derivative changes from negative to positive, I've identified a relative min. And if that first derivative changes from positive to negative, I've identified a relative max. So that's kind of where I'm going with this problem. And uh, as I get ready to take off and jump on the derivative, I've identified a product rule. It's x times e to the x power. And so I'm just going to talk myself through it. I've got the first times the derivative of the second, which is itself, plus the second times the derivative of the first. As I get ready to set this function equal to zero, I'm going to, as in most cases, um, it's beneficial to pull out the GCF if there is one. I'm going to set this bear equal to zero. We're ready to tee it up. And we're going to see something pretty interesting happen here. Um, if, you know, if I said the quantity x plus 1 had to equal 0, then of course x equals negative 1. That goes without saying. But what about e to the x equaling 0? There's two ways to approach this. Number one, you could visualize that graph and ask yourselves, well, when does this curve have a height of 0? Well, hopefully you said never, and that's true. Or you could take, uh, instead of a graphical approach, you could take an algebraic approach where we take the natural log of both sides in an effort to use our, our good friend the zap rule. And it cleans up nice here, we get x, but then what happens is the natural log of zero is undefined, it doesn't exist. So either way, whether you take a graphical approach or an algebraic approach, you're gonna get a non-existent answer. And so there's only one critical point here. Domain is all real numbers, so I'm gonna extend my number line infinitely in both directions. Always use f prime on top, f on the bottom. Our notation is very, very important here to me in just taking care of all the little details. What I want to do now is I'm going to select a number within the interval of uh, somewhere between negative infinity and negative 1. And probably the friendliest number might be, oh golly gee, uh, probably negative 2, I would guess. So let's substitute um, f prime of negative 2. I'm going to plug it in right here. Ladies and gentlemen, e raised to any power, and I don't care if it's e raised to the negative 1 billionth power, is still going to be positive because of the fact that that graph's always above the x-axis. So e to the negative 2 is positive, negative 2 plus 1, of course, is negative, and the product will give me a negative answer. And then I'm going to pick another number uh, between negative 1 and 0, or I'm sorry, negative 1 and infinity, and that is going to be 0. F, uh, let's see here. Oh, what's going on? f prime of 0. Okay, I think I, hopefully I got my screen straightened out. e to the 0 is 1, 0 plus 1 is 1, so I got positive results there. So we just determined the function, f's decreasing and then change to increasing, and I'm going to put it all together. Uh, I'm going to say f has a relative min at x equals negative 1, because why? f prime changed from, and here's where you want to be really specific, negative to positive. We could also make a comment that there are no relative maxes because f prime never changed from positive to negative. 
All right, our last one for tonight, I want to try to tackle some points of inflection. And so I want you to consider the function uh, e to the x minus e to the negative x all divided by 2. And so again, the comment I made on the last slide was I said I think that one of the commonalities of all really strong calc students is their ability to rewrite the original function. And in this particular case, I would just say 1 half of e to the x minus 1 half e to the negative x. And uh, just to really emphasize the fact that we're not going to fall into the trap of using the quotient rule in this particular problem, just because my denominator was a constant, I could avoid it. Um, you could factor out the one half. I don't know if that's going to really save us any, any time or make our derivatives any easier. So our first derivative is going to be simply one half e to the x. And of course, the derivative of the exponent is just one. And then I've got positive one half e to the negative x. The reason I made that a positive was because when I derived the exponent up here, I got a negative one, which made this bear positive. Okay, now I'm going to jump on the second derivative. And again, that first term does not change again. And then this time I'm back to a negative. 1 half e to the negative x. And a very strange phenomenon happened. I just took out to the second derivative and it's a, identical to the original function. It's kind of wild. And of course, and I maybe should have mentioned this right from the onset here, is that points of inflection, I'm already saying to myself, all right, not only am I going to take the second derivative, I'm going to set them equal to zero, find all my critical points, but I'm going to make a sign chart and I want to see on that sign chart if f double prime actually changes signs. If it doesn't change signs, then we've failed to have a point of inflection. So what I'm going to do is let's go ahead and set this second derivative equal to zero. And now from here on out, there's not really any calculus per se, just a lot of heavy algebra. And I'm going to grab my GCF right now. And it's going to be one half, and I'm going to grab the term of the smallest exponent, which is e to the negative x. Um, remember, when you pull out a GCF, you are dividing. So when I divide the first term by what I pulled out, I'm going to subtract the exponents and end up with e to the 2x power. And then the second term, when I divide him by what I pulled out, I just get minus 1. So we're going to set that bear equal to 0. And we're going to tee it up right now. And as I tee this up, again on the outside, even though the exponent's negative, I can promise you the e function... And, and we could graph that particular one. It's just the decreasing version. It's a uh, mirror image over the uh, reflection over the y-axis. It's still always positive, so it'll never equal zero, and there's no solutions there. On the flip side, we're going to set this bear equal to zero. We're going to add our one over. Now here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the natural log of both sides, and I get 2x equals the natural log of 1 which if you can picture the natural log graph, that's where he crosses the x-axis, and so the value right there at 1 is 0, and therefore x equals 0 is my one and only critical point. All right, that's my critical point, but we have no guarantee that that's a point of inflection until we have constructed our sign chart. Shoot, I don't want to go up. I don't want to lose sight of that derivative. All right, so I've got my sign chart here. And 0 is my only critical point. We're going to plug this into f double prime and then describe f. Now what I'm going to do is within this first interval right here, I'm going to pick a, I'm going to pick a, pick a pretty negative number just to kind of convince myself. Now the good news is, is I'm not even going to waste my time plugging into this guy because I'm guaranteeing myself that that's positive. I know that for a fact. I just have to worry about this rascal over here. And uh, I mean, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to substitute a negative 10. So that would be e... Um, to the negative, what would that be? If I plugged in a negative 10, that'd be negative 1 fifth minus 1. Well, here's what I know. Even though this e to the negative 1 fifth is positive, you can go back and look at the graph that we flashed on the screen at the beginning of the video. And what you do know is even though it's positive, it is smaller than 1. So by the time I subtract 1, I'll end up with a negative result, which tells me that f's concave down of some sort. And then, uh, you know, then I'll substitute like maybe a positive 10 and e to the 20 minus 1. Oh my goodness, e to the 20 is enormous. So even after you subtract 1, you're still very positive, which means f's concave up. And we do, can, we can confirm right now, and I want to practice this justification because I don't want this to be the one reason we didn't get a 5 on the exam. Let's say that f has a point of inflection at x equals 0 because f double prime 
changed, and you could say from negative to positive, but I'm just going to say change signs. That's, that's as specific as we need to be on points of inflection. And then my curiosity got the best of me, and I actually graphed this function, and he looked a lot like the x cubed function, in, except he never flattened out as much. He never had, um, never had a horizontal tangent line. He did change concavity there at the origin, but he never flattened out. He continued to kind of increase rather steeply near the origin. And so you'll notice right there we have a change in concavity. This bears concave down. We switched, and now we're concave up very slightly there. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Hope we feel pretty good about deriving exponential functions. And I will see you tomorrow.